What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Packaday Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Packaday Podcast. Yes, Rachel Hopmeyer's here. She's old news. She's here every Wednesday. So whatever. More importantly, we have the one and only Bailey Burmaster with us today. She is a sports anchor for Cleveland 19 News. You can follow her on Twitter at Bayburm TV. She's a former Packers reporter, current Browns reporter, hence why we want to have her on, although we would welcome her anytime she wants to come on. She is the one and only Bailey Burmaster. Bailey, welcome back to the Packaday podcast. Andy, you always make me feel so loved. And it makes it that much better that we just take digs at Rachel on our way to do that as well. <laughs> That's it's okay. I've prepared. I, I have my fluffy armor on. We're good. That's awesome. And I guess if you want to follow Rachel as well, you can follow her on Twitter at Rachel Hotmeyer. She's also the best, but you know, we have to give you a hard time, Rachel, and you're here every week and stuck with me every week. So we're going to celebrate Bailey today. Bailey, we before we, before we jump into Brown's drama, because we could probably talk for 40 minutes just on that and everything that's going on with the team right now. For those who maybe are you know not as familiar of your time covering the Packers and now going to Cleveland, um, just kind of give us the the Cliff Notes version of your journey from uh, start to Packer reporter to Browns reporter and everything that you're kind of working on right now. Yeah, so I joined the Packers beat with WBAY TV in 2019, I believe, in March April. Um, got there and. Uh, hit the ground running because my I, one of my first big assignments was the draft of Jordan Love um and you're going oh, okay yeah like you know you run through that meal of everything and um spent two years covered back-to-back NFC championship games and um you know my time there was I loved it it was awesome to cover a franchise like the Green Bay Packers and spend time there and not only like really learn about the NFL, but just become a better reporter. Um, I have, I'll always brag on my station there with Chris Roth and Dave Schrader. They do a great job and I would not be in Cleveland if it wasn't for them. So big ups to them for taking me in in my time there. Um, so I had a short deal, two-year contract, and I honestly thought I was going to be there a third year, and I kind of wanted to when the offseason came, and all of a sudden Aaron Rodgers is unhappy and he wants to be traded, and it's Aaron Rodgers' watch every single day. Um, and then um, Cleveland just kind of happened, and before I knew it, I even, I'm even i friends with Rachel, and I think I told her, I was like, I think I'm going to Cleveland like it was just kind of like it happened all so quickly and so now I've been here for a few months now and I really hit the ground running when I got to Cleveland because I got here and it was immediately training camp time and it's just so different to see how different teams operate different personalities even like the rules of training camp you know the Packers are pretty tight about their rules about what you can't tweet what you can and I remember when I got here to Cleveland and you know I'm, I'm meeting all the PR people and I'm like okay so like what are the do's and don'ts what am I not allowed to do like you know trying to get the ins and outs and they were like oh anything in practice you can shoot anything and I was like wait what you know you're like oh that's okay, amazing okay awesome great um and you you know the media realm here is great it's been an interesting season to say the least uh the drama I left behind in Green Bay uh I picked it right back up here in Cleveland I was gonna say it almost seems to follow you from one team to the other I don't know if there's a correlation am I the drama can I reference that TikTok am I the drama is it me no Bailey's the villain I am the villain 1000 percent we always joke about this if I went on like the bachelor red or the bachelor or whatever I literally I couldn't go on that show because it, two things would happen. I would either win or they would make me the villain. Yeah. There's no in between. Like, I'm not like one of those girls that makes it like, oh, top eight. No, I'm either the villain or I'm going to win. Um, you know, so, there's only one way to find out. It, you know, I, I like my career too much. There's, there's always uh, bends in the road. You never know where like. You know, I, I'll say this. If I get canceled at any point, <clears throat> then I'll take that route. Okay. Deal. Now I want to work to get you canceled just so we'll start today. We'll lay the groundwork just so we can see you on The Bachelor. Yeah, Bailey. Canceled. We had Nick Vile on. Uh, I just had Nick Vile on last week, former uh, Bachelor. So uh, if he's listening, Nick, get uh, get Bailey on. the. Uh, do you want to be on The Bachelor or The Bachelor? Like, I don't even, I don't know how it works. I'm, I guess I would be on The Bachelor, right? Like first, I have to yeah. date a guy, I'm, but like, I don't know. I, I would be one of the, like, It'd be really hard. We are totally just ranting and pivoting a different direction right now. I knew this was going to happen because this is us in a nutshell. So I'll make this quick. Basically, I know that like one, I'm picky. So if I'm not into the guy, I would literally just be like, hey, 
I know I just showed up, but like, thanks, but no thanks. And I would just like leave Yeah. or I would get too drunk the first night or like I said, maybe I'd be into the guy and then who knows, who knows, but long story short, um, I don't even know what the original Packer question was. <laughs> well, I, oh, drama, s- drama, the drama. Yes. I'm the drama. Yes, I am the drama. So you stole one of my questions, or at least you answered one of my questions before I could ask it. I, I, is there any other differences that you notice just from covering the, the Browns and the Packers and how each organization is run? And do you feel one is better than the, I don't, you know, I, I'm not asking you to, you know, run down either franchise, but um, just some, some of those other differences that you may have noticed. You know, I've, had a lot of in-depth conversations with some of the media people here and um, one sticks out to me when I first got here because they were just asking me like what was it like covering the Packers like obviously it's the Packers and I was like it's great you know they everyone asks you what's Aaron Rodgers like and I'm like I don't have anything bad to say like he was always really nice to me in passing and um, he's very articulate articulate and you know I don't want to say calculated but he he knows what he's doing he knows how to answer the question um so, you know, we'll start there. And then the question is, oh, well, where do you think this Browns team is going to end up? And, you know, I watched a couple Browns games last year, but I mean, obviously I was watching the Packers more and, um, you know, they end up going to the playoffs for the first time in 20 something years. And what people fail to realize is they won a lot of close games, a lot. Um, and that was a big difference maker. And it's always usually a big difference maker in the AFC North. Uh, and I kept going, you know, everyone wants to talk about the talent of this team, but like great teams can consistently win and consistently make the playoffs. And I know that because I covered the Packers and they went to back-to-back NFC championship games and lost. Like I know uh, players say this and like, I think people sometimes lose sight that it is so hard to not only win in the NFL, but get to an NFC championship or an AFC championship and then get to a Super Bowl. Um, and I was never super optimistic. I mean, I wasn't a negative fancy. I was like, they're not making the playoffs. But I was like, you know what? Like, ask me week five. I need to see what this team is actually made of. And yet it's funny because in week one against the Chiefs, I was like, okay, you play like this? Yeah, you might make the playoffs. Um But as things keep going, and I hate bringing up the word culture with the Browns because you can tell they've tried so hard to turn things around and it's trending in the right direction despite everything you've seen. Um, There comes a point where it's just, it's taking that next step and cutting out more of the BS of who's saying what or things getting out of the locker room. And that's what's been telltale to me is um, there's just been things that kind of seep out and you're going, okay, that would never happen with the Packers. Like uh, an example, um, the Browns lose to the Patriots, Miles Garrett's at the podium and he's talking and someone asked about halftime adjustments. And he kind of just made the remark that there were no halftime adjustments. People don't say that. Like, I, 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 under, I understand there's like, you know, people, Packers fans are football fanatics. Not everyone is, but when you look at it like that, you're going, people don't just come out and say that. Right. You know, and that's like a red flag to people in the media who are listening to them constantly. And so sure enough, that kind of becomes a storyline. And I think that is a part of accountability when there's a curve of taking the next step, so to speak. So the Packers are way past that. They have Aaron Rodgers. They have Devontae Adams. They have people who can step up and nip stuff in the butt. Um, I think the Browns are still trying to find that culture in those people. So when you feel like maybe coaches aren't doing what they need to do or X, Y, Z, a guy like Miles Garrett, who's getting paid millions of dollars and is the star of this team can say things like that. And it's about holding accountability. It doesn't, I don't think it's about disrespect. Coaches may not like it, but there is accountability there. And so it all comes back to accountability culture and a locker room. And it fascinates me because, you know, in a way the Packers have dealt with a lot when it comes to Aaron Rodgers, right? Especially with this off season. And somehow LaFleur and Rodgers relationships stays intact. Everyone on the team understands like that is his thing. The show goes on. That's his, the show goes on. And when your culture is so new, like the Browns, when you're dealing with OBJ, OBJ's dad, Kareem Hunt's dad saying these things, there comes a point where it's just like, we don't have this foundation yet. Um, so it's hard and I hate it for the Browns because I really do think they're trying to do the right things. Unfortunately, it's just like, 
one thing after another, especially this season becomes the downfall. And I think that's the difference I see is just like, despite maybe some of the hardships that the Packers have dealt with, uh, especially in the off season, they know how to put it behind them and move forward because they've, they've done that and they have the people to make that happen. Um, and I just think the Browns are a little fresh to it all. So then I guess, do you think with the current Browns team, the way it is and the, ne- the necessary steps that need to be taken to build that next step, can it be done with the people that are in-house now? Or do you think there needs to be more cleaning out? <sighs> Good question. I don't know quite how to answer because I am very delicate about commenting on things that I don't know fully about, right? Like I'm not in meetings with Kevin Stefanski and Baker Mayfield. I don't see those behind door conversations. And obviously those play a huge part. What I can tell you is I think there's enough inconsistency within this football team that there has to be something done to find that consistency. Now, whether that's at quarterback or with head coach or with a clean slate even, Um, it's just kind of been a snowball effect all season. And I think that's, what's against the Browns. You know, I don't think everyone wants to put it on Baker being hurt or Kevin Stefanski, just his offense isn't working or OBJ's freelancing his routes. And that's the problem of everything, whatever it is. I don't think it's just one thing. I think there's a lot going on that we don't see that's causing this whole snowball of this isn't quite looking like it's supposed to. Um, and I think we'll learn more about what that answer is once the season's over. I think you bring up one of the really interesting things that gets sort of buried and in, in, in for, you know, buried for bad teams and, and taken for granted with good teams. And I look back at Ron Wolf and what he had to inherit. And then to go from that to such a quick turnaround to being a competitive team by the moves that he made to purge some of those really negative attitudes and everything. And then bringing in a Reggie White and a Brett Favre and just doing a full 180 with the organization. It is the hardest thing I think in sports is to take a franchise that has baggage and drama and has been a a cult. You brought up the perfect word culture, right? Just a a culture of whether it's toxicity or whether it's just, it's not a great culture And to have to go in there as a new general manager or president or who's ever trying to build that turnaround and to take that over and purge everything out, start from scratch and build it back up. It is the toughest thing to do. And I think overall, if you look at where the Browns were even just a few years ago, I think they've taken some pretty drastic steps in the right direction. But even with those, even with all the stuff that they've done and trying to purge all those things and so on and so forth, it's still is difficult and we're still seeing the Browns go through some of these struggles in what year two of Stavansky, right? Yeah. And you know, something else I want to bring up too, is when you're talking about all that culture and stuff, I look at a team like the Browns and the Packers and something else that I noticed that is different. That's just literally just hit me as you're talking about that raw emotion. I think when you're building a culture, you're so, you can't see behind the curtain. You can't see behind the curtain because we don't want you knowing anything, right? Yeah. Um, the Packers. There were a lot of people on that roster that really try to give you good answers, whether it's Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams, David Bakhtiari, Mercedes Lewis you ask and and they're gonna they're gonna give you they're gonna do their best to give you real answers something that lacks with the Browns is almost there's like a lack of emotion like there's a fine line and I get like you know I could be on the other side and be like oh they're too emotional they should they should stop like it's causing drama right but I think I just a perfect example I asked Joel Petonio after the game I said because someone just asked him how do you not let this loss snowball at the end of the season like if you win out you potentially could make the playoffs like you know it, it's important you know he's he was just like you know I don't think guys are holding their head yeah the locker room's like looks defeated right now but we'll get back in there Monday and I just said you know to double down on that do you ever look back at the season and just kind of go <sighs> because you're dealing with a lot of things that other teams haven't had to how do you make sure that you know, you have a depleted roster. How do you make sure that defeat 
of every week and your struggle doesn't become so heavy that it's unmanageable. And it was, you know, the answer is it is heavy and we, but you have to notice it and you have to rally as a team and someone's got to step up, like whatever, something like that. But the answer was, you know, like, we'll get back in there Monday. We'll look at the tape. It's a short week. So that's good for us. And it's just like, come on. You know, sometimes, and and Stefanski is like the king of it. I I, like, it's so funny because I thought like, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I would be like, oh, LaFleur, another press conference. Like you you, you don't give us much. And it's funny because I look back and I'm like, no, LaFleur has a personality compared to Stefanski. And it's just, and and it's, it, it sucks because it's hard to really gauge a person when you can't get to know a person. Realism. Sorry, I was gonna say realism and an organic personality and just an organic, like an organic feel. It goes so incredibly far. And you get that feel from Matt LaFleur. And you know, he doesn't always give it, you know, necessarily to the media. And you know, you'll see him from time to time like ad lib and say a joke here or there and things like that. But you can very easily pick it up that his players appreciate the real, you know, the reality that he lives in and the realism that he coaches with. And, you know, nothing's perfect. Right. I think, you know, he understands that, you know, if he tries to coach to perfection, it's never going to work. And his, his realism and his organic personality, I think really does wonders for green Bay. I really do. And here's my hypothetical for you. Right. Okay. So if you can see that out of the floor and you can sit here and say his players respect that and see that, if I can't see that at Stefanski, what makes me believe I can, the Browns players can see it at Stefanski. Exactly. When you're just limited to the podium itself where that should be on display. Yeah, no, I agree. And you know, I think the other thing too is right. Like I think some of the best coaches now, uh, a, a Belichick and a Saban may be the, the antithesis of this, but you know, allowing to see some of the, the personality helps your job. It helps you with the media. You know, it gives you a better persona. It it, it helps. I think it helps a lot of different things too. So we could jump into a lot of, I think, different segues there, but it's a really interesting thing to discuss and just the the overall leadership, the culture in Cleveland and why I think it's such a great thing for Packer fans to listen to, because it's so easy to take it for granted because it's been so good since the early nineties. And yes, there've been some hiccups here and there, but the fact that Matt LaFleur can come in and maybe make a few tweaks to some of the things that maybe started to erode away towards the end of McCarthy's tenure, but it's not like you had to re- completely rebuild everything from scratch, right? It's just taking a couple of tweaks to what has already been existing to a successful culture in Green Bay. And voila, you've got back-to-back NFC championship teams and who knows what the ceiling is on this team. Yeah, exactly. And I could, and I think like another perfect example of all of that would maybe be Baker Mayfield. There's people who hate him because of his moxie or his confidence or his arrogance, whatever you want to, however you want to describe it. And there's people who love him because at least he's himself, Yeah, you know, and sometimes that's what you need. What's, what's my favorite Batman quote? So like you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Like it is what it is. And you, you can't fault someone who's at least themselves. Right. So very much so. I want to ask you about, you know, the state of this Browns team that has nothing to do with culture because all the culture stuff is insanely interesting. And again, we could probably go on for another three hours just based on that, but this is a Browns team that I'm going to see if I have this right. So I have listed Jarvis Landry, Jedrick Wills, James Hudson, Austin Hooper, Baker Mayfield, Case Keenum, Kareem Hunt, Malik McDowell, Jadavian Clowney, Afadi Adenigbo, Tony Fields, Jacob Phillips, Mac Wilson, Troy Hill, AJ Green, Grant Delpit, Ronnie Harrison, Jamie Gillian, Drew Forbes, Ross Travis, Jojo Natson, and Nate Meters. Poor Nate Meters. Uh, I that are have all. You on that. What's that? I should have timed you to see how fast you should you have. Are. All right. on the COVID list currently. If that wasn't bad enough. Uh, also did not practice on Tuesday had they actually practiced, but these were the hypothetical did not practice miles Garrett, Malik Jackson, John Johnson, Greg Newsom, and Simone Taki Taki, which is one of the great names. I probably butchered it, but still one of the great names in all of NFL the Browns have some, some personnel issues based on COVID and injuries right now. It's a hot mess. It's a hot mess. And that, you know, I had made a statement earlier this week where I basically was just like, the Browns don't match up with the Packers right now. And, you know, I would have trouble sitting here saying with confidence, you know, it's going to be a great game if even all their starters were out just because of the state of this offense and its inconsistencies. But 
Man, I mean, COVID just depleted them. They've dealt with injuries. Miles Garrett has, we don't know how severe this groin injury is, but he talked about it in post game and he said it wasn't fun to play with and it was painful, but he wasn't coming out of that game. Uh, on top of that, defensive end uh, Tack McKinley put on IR because he ruptured his Achilles. I mean, the team really can't catch a break. And I do feel for them, you know, as hard as a lot of people are on them. I look and it's week two. Since week two, even week one, week one, the storyline was, is OBJ going to play? And it was like, oh, like everyone wanted to see Jadavian Clowney and Miles Garrett go up against a young Chiefs offense or offensive line. And then week two hit and Baker messes up his shoulder and it just has, it's all gone downhill from there. Every week there's something and there's some big loss and it's, it's tough. I, I commend them for doing what they're doing right now, even, I mean, despite losing to the Raiders in a really, really tough game, they put up a really valiant effort and they tried really hard and you thought they were going to come out with a win and they just couldn't do it. But yeah, it's uh, worrisome. And, you know, Kevin Stefanski said on Tuesday that point blank, they just have to work with the guys they have now and see what happens, but they will plan to, because even Stefanski's on the COVID list still, they will plan to have two separate like travel parties um, to get to Green Bay if they have to, because Crazy. that's how it's trending. And that was my concern last week when all this became a thing is, okay, yeah, like they're going to be out against the Raiders, but there were people on the list from the week prior and they're still on the list now. So how, how are you sure they're going to be back for the Packers game? Um, uh, you feel for everyone. And, you know, I commend them for not just rolling over because that's very Agreed. easy to do. Um, and I'll be interested to see how they respond on Saturday um, because it was a very defeated locker room after the Raiders loss and they're very depleted. What can they come out and do? You know, I, I, I find it hard to sit here and say, yeah, they're going to shock the world, but maybe we'll see a team we haven't seen because they're playing with a little bit more heart and grit and they know people, they know people like me are sitting here saying, yeah, I can't, I can't put my money on that. They don't look great. They haven't looked great. And maybe that will piss them off. My biggest thing is if Miles Garrett's injury gets worse or he's not able to play at hundred percent, you know, I feel like he's one of the only credible threats to the Packers on Saturday. How big of a blow is that going to be to the Browns? If Miles Garrett isn't Miles Garrett. Talk about the one person you probably don't want to lose on this team, even with Baker Mayfield, I'm sitting here going, between Baker Mayfield and Miles Garrett. I mean, I obviously being a Texas girl, Miles Garrett went to Texas A&M. He's with the Browns. I never really like seen him in person. It, he is a specimen. It is, he's a freak of nature. And what he's able to do with his size and his speed is just ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And he's, he's scary. No, like, I can't tell you, it's probably been 20 times someone on the Browns has said, I'm just so happy he's on our team. I'm just so happy he's on our team. And like, let's not discredit Jadavian Clowney. So you have Garrett and Clowney, <sighs> stupid. That's stupid. Um, but he's someone you don't want to lose. I, here's my thing though. I don't know how severe this is. And they did set, Stefanski said on Tuesday, he was like, we're still evaluating that. Who knows what that means, but I'll tell you, it's going to take a lot to keep Garrett off that field. You, you brought up the deflated nature of, of yesterday's game or on Monday's game. They fought, I thought, really hard. It looked like they were going to pull out a win. Mullins has the late touchdown. That team has to be on, in a way, cloud nine right before the Raiders get the ball back. They've got a chance, with despite all the things that we just mentioned with this team, they've got a chance to get a huge win against the Raiders and, and really put themselves in a, a solid position to potentially make the playoffs. And then the Raiders go down, get in field position, kick the game, winning field goal. I have to imagine that you know, not only is that deflating, but that that's a morale crusher after fighting that hard through that game. What do you think the Browns have left going out on a short week, besides all the things we mentioned on a short week to Lambeau on Christmas day? You know, to be honest, I think the best thing for this team right now, what, no matter how hurt he is, is to get Baker Mayfield back. Um, it's hard to tell on this team who the true leaders are 
and who the players respect the most. Um, sometimes I think it, Miles might be one of the defensive guys, but there's times where I feel like he's kind of more of a watch what I do leader mm -hmm. than this is what I'm going to say. Um, I would say Baker's both. And I think at his, watching him at his time at Oklahoma, um, people would vouch that he's both. Unfortunately, when you're hurt, it's hard to do it with your play. But you know what? He's not afraid to get in people's faces. He's not, a, he's not afraid to not be your friend, so to speak. You know, say what he needs to say. Um, and I just think they could use his fire, honestly. Um, because whether they're able to make the playoffs or not, Baker's favorite quarterback is Brett Favre. I don't think he's been to Lambeau Field yet. Um, no, I don't, I don't no, think, I don't so. think so. First time at Lambeau on Christmas. I hope it snows. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. But your man says no. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. Um, so the energy just to play there, like you want to show out, right? So I think his energy could do a lot for that team, but. I mean, the words I kept saying the last couple of days is defeated and depleted. And I think the defeat is easy to overcome if you're not depleted. Um, but you know what? I do, I, do, I do believe that there's coaches and not just Stefanski that will step up and say, like, you don't turn your back when it gets hard. You want to prove something. You have players like Devontae Adams you can go out there and shut down. You can get in Aaron Rodgers' face. You know, you can destroy Eric Stokes, who, whatever, you know, whatever you want to do, you can go out there and prove it. So go prove something. Prove to the, the NFL that you're not just another team that didn't live up to expectations. Um, but it's hard. It's going to be really hard. But I, I do think the best thing that could happen is for Baker to get out of the COVID um protocol and back with this team and rally the guys. And what's the, the latest on Baker? And, and I know Case Keenum as well. Uh, you know, I, I know it was a little vague on, on Tuesday, but what's your feel on if there's a chance that either Baker or Keenum could be activated on Saturday or by Saturday? We have no idea. <laughs> we have no idea. I do know that uh, Baker and his wife have been very vocal on social media talking about how they're asymptomatic and, you know, they hate that Baker can't be out there, um, but nobody knows. But that was why it was really important to ask Stefanski, like, is your cutoff day to return, you know, X, Y, Z? And is there going to be other plans for travel in case you guys do test out after the team has already left? Um, it's a fluid situation. And even, you know, the Kansas City Chiefs dealing with it now. Yeah. It's a mess for so many teams. And we're having to, everyone's having to roll with the punches. Um, but who knows? It could literally be Nick Mullins again. It's At least we'll have more week preparation than like a day. I, he, I don't even think he had a full day, like of him knowing he was going to be the starter for sure. He didn't know until like the day up or it's crazy. Right at least, they, at least they didn't have to pull a Broncos and uh, play a wide receiver at quarterback like last year. But well, all of us were like, "Yo, are we about to see Jarvis Landry play quarterback?" We were stoked. We were like, "Oh wait, no, <laughs> on COVID." Just kidding. But like, can you imagine? Like, it's the Browns and Jarvis Landry is your quarterback. Let's go! Like, I watch it. Randall Cobb would be a fun watch for Green Bay as well. For and sure. not that we want to see that. I'm not saying that in any way. Shape, I don't know. I kind of do. Why not? Enough. We let's let's wait till week eighteen against the Lions, and then maybe we can see well, Randall Cobb. The entire against. quarterback has the antibodies at this point, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, right? that's true. That's a oh. great point, uh, Rachel. We do have to talk about uh, some Packers stuff though, because MBS does go uh, on the COVID nineteen list as well. Speak of the devil that is COVID nineteen. Your thoughts on MBS going on the list and what that will mean for Green Bay missing him on on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. The Packers, it feels like they just got him back, um, you know, from his hamstring injury. And every week since his return, Rodgers has been targeting him more and more, creating some deeper catches. But unfortunately, it's just another deep threat that Rodgers won't have access to, which is unfortunate because as we've seen the season go on, Rodgers is getting more and more confident in that deep ball. But again, it creates opportunities for guys like DeGuara, who keeps showing up, other wideouts. Um, you know, you still don't have Cobb with that core surgery, but at the end of the day, the Packers do what they do best this season, which is next man up. And that applies to literally every position possible. 
Yeah, I think, you know, Alan Lazard's in the last couple of weeks started to play better. They're still going to have Adams. I mean, knock on wood, assuming this doesn't get out of hand like it has for other teams. Uh, but we will see. And I think they definitely have the players to step up in MVS's absence. All right. I, I, we were going to potentially like break down this game. There's like no way to break down this game when you don't even know who's going to play it. Like it's uh, it's near impossible uh, to, to go through this and be like, well, this is how it's going to go, because if they have their starting quarterback, wide receiver, defensive ends, it's going to look a lot different than if it's Nick Mullins and no Clowney and, and Garrett and so on. So I do want to get your predictions, though, knowing what we know right now. Uh, I know we're still a few days out and I know we don't know a lot right now, but we've got a Browns reporter on. So we got to go through predictions. So, Bailey, I'll start with you. Your prediction for Saturday's game. I am going to go. Thirty one. Seventeen. I like it. All right, Rachel. Oh, wait, 31-17. Packers. <laughs> Just making sure. Uh, Rachel? Um, I was thinking very similar numbers, so I'll be different. I will go 28-14 Packers. I'm going 41-10 Packers. I'm going blowout. Okay. I, I thought about it. I thought about it. And then I was like, you know what? I will give them a little bit of, I, I will give them a little bit benefit of the doubt. Maybe the defense comes up with a touchdown. Maybe Miles Garrett can get a second touchdown of the season or something crazy. But now we could do prices right style. Whereas whoever gets the closest without going over wins. There you go. I'm sure everyone on YouTube will remind us to uh, next week when, uh, you know, who got it closest. But uh, I just think, I think when you're depleted like that and maybe they get everyone back and then, you know, of course my prediction is going to probably look pretty stupid, but uh, you know, if, if they're anywhere near depleted, like they are right now, I think you have that first week where you give it everything you got to sort of overcome. And then when you have it and that falls short, I just think that's going to be so deflating. And now you have to go on the road on Christmas day to Lambeau field to a Packers team. That's playing with a ton of confidence that on the flip side gets a last second win, which I think probably has this team even that much more exhilarated and motivated. I, I think this could get ugly and I think it could be a buzzsaw. I, I, I hope it's a great game. I, I mean, honestly, it should like when I, when the schedule released, this is one that was circled for me as one of the just best games of the season. I thought this was going to be a phenomenal game and I, I, I still hope it is, but um, right now I, I just have a lot of questions with where the Browns are at just physically and how many guys they have actually to play. You and about every Browns fan. I don't think they're alone in that. And I think a lot of the media core was hoping that the bye week, this offense would find its groove. They just have not found rhythm or consistency and they were like, maybe they'll tweak some things and go on a run here. Um, and they're able to get a win against the Ravens. And you're like, okay, you can breathe and big opportunity with the Raiders and then COVID. Um, and their schedule, their remaining schedule is one of the hardest left. So that doesn't help either. Brutal. Rachel, what are you working on? Where can we find you? Tell us what you're doing. Give us all the good news. Uh, Rachel Hopmeyer. I'm just planning when to pick Bailey up from the airport. That's all. Awesome. You know. Fantastic. Uh, Bailey, where can we find you? What are you working on? Tell us all the good news for you. Yeah, I am at Bayburn TV and at Bailey Burmaster, depending on what social medias you go to, whether Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, I am planning to head to Green Bay for this game. So that will be fun. I'm excited to return to the roots, so to speak, and see all my people. Um, and then after that, we have to turn around for a Steelers game in Pittsburgh. Um, yeah, it's, uh, and then after that, they host the Bengals to close out the season. And then before we know it, I, the NBA all-star weekend is going to be here in Cleveland this year. I mean, uh, I'll be, I'll be busy the next couple months. I didn't even get a chance. I wanted to talk some Cavs because they're the most fun team in basketball right now. They are amazing. Evan Mobley's a stud. It's really, really fun. Stud, stud. They are so fun to watch. And you want to talk about culture. They have all bought in and they all play their roles. And that is the we, the reason they are winning. Um, I mean, unfortunately, they all have COVID, COVID too. too. <laughs> COVID protocol <laughs> now. So, I mean, I, Cleveland might be a hot spot. So uh, there you go. Um, but they're so fun to watch. And it's so funny because, you know, people had them winning like 20 games. They're like they're phenomenal now, right? It, yeah. It's like, what? It's like, uh, who is this? But everyone's here for it. And like, even Kevin Love, people who were so quick to write out him out of off. Nowhere. 
him somewhere else. I went to when they played the Heat, and he was just – he had his season-high points all in the second half. I was like, oh, yeah, like um, – Browns will be done soon and we will cover the Cavs. That's for sure. Very much so. Rachel, Bailey, thank you so much for doing this. This is awesome as always. Bailey, move back to Green Bay so you can cover the Packers again. Uh, but in the meantime, appreciate you both greatly. Make sure to follow them both on Twitter. Rachel and I will be back next week. Uh, I will be back here tomorrow. So make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.